Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Paris Talks Marketing. Today, my guest is Martijn van de Veen. And Martijn is the Chief Business Development Officer at ICEF. His career in international education started with the World Youth Student and Education Educational Confederation, which was followed by eight and a half years as the Global Director of the International Student Identity Card in Amsterdam. After four years as founder and MD of Student Card Service Japan in Tokyo, Martijn returned to the Netherlands and joined ICEF in 2019. As ICEF's Chief Business Development Officer, Martijn oversees a number of strategic growth initiatives, specifically in the areas of digital transformation and international education, international student accommodation, and international student financing. He is also the host of the monthly ICEF podcast and a frequent speaker on various topics in international education. Martijn ha holds a degree in Japanese, French, and international business communications. All right, with that, Martijn, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, uh, Paris, and thanks for pronouncing my name correctly. Oh yeah, that's very important to me. I would like to focus primarily on your last few years at mm -hmm. ISF, and you joined in 2019, which was right before yeah. COVID. And I do wonder, um, I, I assume that COVID really had a huge impact on international student recruitment and international student mobility. How did COVID impact that industry and in, in pretty much a, about a year after you joined? Can you tell me about your experience with that? Oh uh, yeah, it, it definitely had an impact, had an impact in so many ways, right? On, on all of us, on our personal lives, our professional lives. And we all thought, well, the world's gonna completely change. And then we realized that was change, but probably the, the pandemic uh, was more of a catalyst for that change. But just for a bit of context. So ISEF is, of course, an, um, very well known as an event organizer, a business-to-business -business networking event organizer for the international education sector. Um, and these events are actually not so much about education, but more about the marketing, recruitment, and admissions and enrollment in, in international education. And obviously, during the pandemic, you couldn't travel. So it was hard to recruit students. And the irony was that the industry start to look at online learning opportunities as an alternative, which was an area that many of us were quite of stayed far away from because this industry is about students who want to study in another country and immerse themselves in the culture. And then online was more or less uh, perceived as the opposite. But the, um, the pandemic made us focus on the opportunities exist in that area and realized that actually online and digital learning opportunities were First of all, a great way to have an alternative during the pandemic for students to still enroll at an institution overseas, albeit in a virtual environment. But second of all, to realize also that there is lots of synergy. There are lots of synergies between online, hybrid, digital learning formats and studying overseas. So I guess one of the major changes that we've seen coming out of the pandemic is that there is um, a greater understanding of the opportunities that come with online learning as pathway programs or to improve your language skills or to improve your chance of admission or to maybe have an online internship as you are actually studying overseas. So these things could really go hand in hand. That's one angle. And the other angle is that many of us use that time to explore other opportunities in general. For me, that was to look at all the digital innovations that are available for us as international education marketing professionals. And there a whole new world opened up for me, which is something that I've been continued also post pandemic, as we as an organization want to make sure that our network of education providers of study abroad agencies and other stakeholders in international education are well aware of all the tools, innovations and uh, services that exist, thanks to technology. And what were some of the hallmarks? Uh, I assume that with COVID, a lot of the recruitment agencies started to move towards virtual career fairs. And I think those are still popular today. Are, are those still a popular medium for lead generation for those agencies? I, yes, I think they are. As any agency or as any education institution, you're looking at the different channels that are available to you to reach international students, prospective international students, to communicate with them. And it's just another tool uh, on the belt, as they say, I believe. Um, so they still do exist. Of course, we also brought our own events Online, we've been organizing virtual events throughout the pandemic and continue that to a certain extent post-pandemic. 
we do realize that the appetite that existed among the stakeholders in international education, I'd imagine that may be the same for students, that ultimately when it involves such an important decision of a student going overseas, um, changing their country, um, spending a lot of money on a program at an institution in a, in a different city, that that's a decision that's not taken lightly. And in the end, you want to talk to a person, look that person in the eye and, and, and meet the people that are involved in that process. So we've brought nearly all our events back to in-person events. Uh, we still do have a number of virtual events available. So I guess that coming out of the pandemic, we learned about the value of online events and how to use them as part of our portfolio of services. And I imagine that's the same for schools and agencies who organize their local events for the students in their different countries. Mm -hmm. Let, let's pull back a second, and I'd like our audience to learn more about mm. ICEF. First of all, I was looking around for this, but what does ICEF, I-C-E-F, what does it stand for? That's a very good question. I believe it stands for International Conference Events and Fairs or International mm. Co Consultants in Events and Fairs. And the irony is that we've been having some internal jokes about what ICEF really means, and I'll, I'll spare the suggestions that were made, but we always say ISEF and never use th that full name in our mm. mind. But, but ISEF now is very focused on international students. What is the mission of ISEF today? Our mission is to make sure that the, the next generation of international students have access to quality education and they get the best possible support, guidance, and advice during that process. And although we ourselves do not deal directly with international students, we deal with the professionals who are involved with that process. And those professionals are, of course, the education providers. And then on the other hand, the study abroad agencies. And then there's a whole range of additional stakeholders involved that provide services that are relevant to them. But the study abroad agencies are the ones that play a very important and crucial role because technically they are the representative of an institution in a country overseas. And therefore, they... I need to adhere to the very strict standards that are uh, implemented by the industry and by ourselves. For example, for any agency that wishes to attend an ISEF event, they go through a very strict screening process. We also have the IAS accreditation, whereby we uh, have an even more thorough screening of agencies to get their um, accreditation. We provide training to agencies uh, through our ISEF Academy program. So we make sure that the Agencies that are involved in the sector, or at least the ones that are attending uh, our events, uh, adhere to the highest standards. So, you know, like I mentioned, this is about mm -hmm. uh, individual people's uh, and dreams and aspirations, and they need to make the right decision, therefore need to work with the right professionals. Great. So it seems that a lot of the schools, the, the most popular destinations, I presume, would be the U.S., Canada. UK, Australia, a lot of these schools, they do want to attract international students. I think it adds to the richness of the student body. Classroom diversity is a big thing. But I guess they lack the, the ability to go directly into a lot of these regions and recruit directly. Although I, I would say now with digital marketing, they, they have increasing ability to do so. But the yeah. role of the agents are to act as their representatives for recruitment in certain regions where the schools yeah. want. They, they want that diversity of their student body. That's right? indeed how it works. Because, you know, any institution is looking to reach prospective students across different markets worldwide. We'll have to deal with uh, different marketing communication channels and different social media ecosystems, specific communication formats, social customs, let alone the different languages. And on top of that, you have to deal with internet restrictions and firewalls in some of the uh, more popular student recruitment markets. And what makes it even more challenging is mm -hmm. that each year you have to do that whole process again. I mean, for example, if you have a regular product, you acquire a customer and from there it's customer relationship building, right? With the objective to generate more revenue from that customer. But an international student recruitment, you're not going to recruit that same student a second time, right? You'll need to reach and attract a a whole new group of students year after year or semester after semester. And that is why indeed most student institutions will use, will use uh, study abroad agencies that are based in the markets uh, where the institutions wish to recruit the students from. Mm -hmm. And obviously these agencies add a lot of value simply because of their understanding, as you alluded to, the understanding of the local market, the understanding of the, they speak the local language. They've got the necessary networks with local schools, associations. They organize a student fair, as you mentioned earlier, and workshops. So technically, they do indeed become that local representative or ambassador of their partner institution. And I, I presume that do many schools outsource the large majority of their international 
recruitment to agents? Or do they still try to get, do they go direct? Do you know of any schools that are doing direct uh, digital marketing into the countries that they want to get students from? Yeah, that's a good question because, you know, typically most institutions have agency partners and then they have their own marketing channels and solutions. And this is a discussion we often have at our events as well, because on the one hand, let's say you have a country like I don't know, Vietnam, where you have an agency or multiple agencies who represent you. And obviously those agencies will start to use their local media channels to create awareness for the institution that they are recruiting students for. And that goes through the typical mix of, of channels, social media, your, your, your affairs. And that could mean that the campaigns of an agency can coexist or collide with the campaign of the institution itself, who may also be visible through specific marketing channels, or it can maybe coexist or collide with the uh, campaigns of another agency who also works with a, a specific institution. So the fact that an institution works with an agency, it doesn't just make give them peace of mind saying, thinking, okay, that market is covered. It, it really comes down to close cooperation with those agencies on the marketing messages and when to reach who, where, and how. And that really comes down to um, transparency. But yeah, the, I think that challenge is come, becoming even bigger because digital marketing innovations allow schools and institutions to better reach the specific uh, students in specific countries. And that can be an advantage, but that can also cause some challenges with the efforts that the agencies make in the specific countries. How would you overall rate the, the level of digital maturity of most of these agencies? The irony is that neither the institution or the agency are, is a true marketing specialist. And I really hope that I'm not insulting anyone here, but obviously for study abroad agencies, the simple fact that they understand the local market and their local youth and student demographics doesn't really make them digital marketing experts, especially now that we're dealing with this avalanche of digital innovations. It really is hard for these recruiting professionals, whether institutions or agencies, to keep track of the the latest developments in digital and marketing. And for our sector, you got AI-powered chatbots and virtual assistants. you got your personalized marketing campaigns, your predictive analytics. There's the use of AR and VR and uh, that allowed to create this immersive and very appealing campus tours. And there's the evolution and diversity of social media and the different messaging tools and formats that come with it, targeted advertising work with influencers. There's really a lot. And, and we recognize that we might need to help our network of stakeholders in international education here a little bit in finding and identifying which tools and innovations should be used and are available to them. And that's something we're really focusing on at the moment with ISA. I'm curious to know how much of the marketing, the student lead gen marketing is directed at directly to the students versus their parents? Yeah, there's a lot of marketing is or perhaps should be focused on the parents as well. And, you know, and to think in, in most cases, it's the parents who pay for their education over for the education of their sons or daughters, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of marketing isn't necessarily aimed at the prospective student, but indeed at the families around them. And I suppose with a lot of cultures around the world, the, the parents really have a, a big, big part in that decision, not only because they're the ones paying for it, but they also probably have certain dreams and aspirations for their kids. And they're going to take a very proactive approach. And, and I think that, that that's probably a cultural difference compared to, say, a lot of maybe kids in the U.S. or in Western Europe that might be more proactive in their own college search. But I guess that's one clear differentiation is that the agents speak the language. I, I presume a lot of parents don't speak English as well as their students who, who have to be pretty proficient to, to be able to study abroad in these countries. So... I think that is a barrier to entry there for universities to market directly because they would have to have a very complex multilingual campaigns running. Yeah, that, that's really true. I think of an example where you have a family in Brazil and indeed they want their son or daughter to study overseas. Now, that's, of course, a big decision. That's not something they do on the click of a mouse and you do want to maybe talk to a professional about this. I always compare it with the following. Let's say if you were to buy a book, you can easily do that online. If you want to buy... A washing machine, you might buy, buy it online. A car, maybe you'll check things online and then you go to a car dealership to really look at the car and drive it and get some advice from it. A car dealership. If you want to buy a house, you probably don't do that on the click of a, of a mouse, right? You go and, and talk to a, a real estate agent. Now, education is, again, a, a, a probably a once-in-a-lifetime decision that is very uh, costly, a big investment. 
again, you want to talk to a professional, to an agent, ideally that speaks your own language. So even if you're good at English, it's probably helpful just to sit down with someone who understands you, understands your culture, understands your background that you feel comfortable with. Uh, to have that conversation on where or where your son or daughter should study indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about one of the new players in this space, the student recruitment agency space, which are these so-called aggregators. And two names come to mind. One is Aventus, the other is Apply Board. These are two different sites that I've been spending some time on lately yeah. to prepare for ISEF Digital yeah. coming up. And from what I can see, they're, they are actually bringing together under one roof the agencies, the students, and the universities. And m most of the initial user experience is led by a really robust search and recommendation engine. And it seems that they work with all of the schools in instead of just small representative samples. And so they're trying to bring together all the schools and all the students and also serve agencies. But in a way, also, they seem to be crowding out the agencies a bit. How do you see this new dynamic with aggregators now becoming a pretty dominant force in international student recruitment? I would actually question the fact whether they are becoming that dominant. There was a concern in the market about aggregators becoming dominant. And uh, although I don't want to mm -hmm. call it any specific aggregator, and I believe that even the what we refer to now as an aggregator, they don't like the term aggregator themselves, so they call themselves digital recruitment platforms or digital agent platforms, but I'd say like to tomato, tomato, mm -hmm. right? But on the one hand, an aggregator is a very smart innovation in an industry that has not yet been disrupted by the Booking.com or Uber-style organizations that allow to indeed aggregate the offer that exists in the education industry in terms of education providers worldwide. You cannot as an agent, you cannot be the specialist of all the programs and institutions that exist worldwide, right? There's this economies of skill and obviously these aggregators can uh, use the latest technologies and be very sophisticated. On the other hand, it does add an extra layer to the recruitment process and a lot of the agencies in our industry are concerned about the direct relationship that they often no longer have with the institution that they are, are supposed to represent. You know, the question is how can we represent an institution that we don't have any personal dealings with, right? So it may be easy for an agency to be able to represent a school that a specific uh, student is interested in, and it might even be an advantage. But on the other hand, they probably have never visited that school, don't know anyone at that institution. So there's a challenge that their information and advice is not always where it should be based on any personal relationship or experience that they have of students that they have sent there. I guess that an aggregator probably fills the space in this sector. So it, it, it's um, a response to a specific need. But I, at the same time, do not expect that the aggregators will become overly dominant. There is still a need for institutions to work directly with agencies, again, because we're dealing here with people. This is not about booking a weekend in Paris, or it's not about booking a taxi. This is about booking a future. And for that, you need to have the right level of quality and assistance, which comes back to what we have as our mission statement, right? That we want to make sure that the highest quality is always the objective. Right. So I think it's a question of, let's say, high volume, low touch versus low yeah. volume and high touch. And quality and quantity of the paradox is, that you see in so many industries. Right. And I suppose the student admissions uh, departments themselves, they don't get served well with getting flooded with low quality applications that they're going to have to reject. Yeah. I mean, maybe that I mean, statistically, that might lower the, the acceptance rate, which might make them appear more selective, yeah. but that's not real. If they're just getting flooded with low-quality yeah. applicants from these large portals, but it's not really creating efficiency. Like, I'm sure that there's, their goal is to create more efficiency, but I, I believe the nature of this decision is such that the aggregators, I believe, still should be referring qualified candidates to, to the agents that they partner yeah. with. And I think that that is still how they're set up. Don't agents come onto a platform like Aventus and Apply Board, and they can actually recruit students through that? Does Aventus refer students to the agency partners? Yeah. Or do they refer them straight into the school application? Yeah, I guess you'd have to ask Advantage that or Apply Board and you have the other aggregators. But if I can give you another example, technically ISEF is a platform where agents come together to meet with institution partners, but there they get to actually make that connection and meet with the institutions directly or the institutes meet with the agency directly. And, it, and that brings me back to that screening of the agencies that are involved. I would argue that it's... Mm -hmm. 
nearly impossible for an aggregator to be screening all these agencies that they uh, wish to accept to their platforms and guarantee the quality of recruitment uh, in, in this format, in this model, right? This is what we do at ISAF, is making sure that there is the right quality standards that are implemented for this sector. But yeah, there's, there is a lot of discussion about the whole aggregator model. We've got some opponents of the system. Then there are those that say, well, it does respond to a need in the market. And it's just a recurring topic at our event each year. What has become obvious to me is that now with AI, any agency really can, in a, in a way, they can replicate a lot of the data advantages and the digital scale advantages that these aggregators have, because now it's pretty easy to build uh, an AI agent and you can train it on specific data that you have that might be proprietary data specific to the list of schools that you represent. And if you can go to market with that agent, you could deliver even a superior experience than someone that would go into an aggregator portal and go through more classic search and filtering experience. You can have a real experience, a real chat experience you know, with a knowledgeable agent. Do you see that as an opportunity for, for agencies to really level yeah, up it, their, their it, game? Absolutely. Uh, were and are built on the latest technologies that are out there. Some really smart entrepreneurs who took that technology to that advantage, built the platforms around it and introduced a new way of recruiting students or changed way of recruiting students in the industry. And at the same time, now the technology is being so advanced that it becomes available for all main stakeholders and players in international education who can then introduce those services themselves because they're so accessible now. So we've had conversations uh, on the ISAF podcast earlier where AI was discussed as potentially being now a threat for aggregators. And that brings me to the whole scope of AI and digital innovations in our sector, because you're now asking one question that can be hundreds of questions on the impact that digital and AI really have on the way students are recruited, on the efficiency of agents involved, on the quality of recruitment. And, and that's exactly what we were discussing throughout the full day at, uh, at ISF Digital, right? There we're looking at the entire student recruitment process, every step in that funnel. And we're discussing the digital innovations that are available in that process or that are expected in the process to then see how can the uh, professionals in international student recruitment take advantage of these innovations and are they all to our benefit or are they all to the student's benefit? There's some interesting conversation coming out of that. And one I'd like to highlight in particular, and that is what I call the personalization paradox, because, you know, as I mentioned, the event that I discussed, I said, is about every step in the recruitment funnel. And at the top of that funnel, you have your marketing, right? That's also your area of specialism, uh, Paris. So where the communication and information process starts. And a lot of that mm -hmm. can be automated, right? You get your personalized marketing campaigns, for example, and they are increasingly automated messages based on algorithms and on things like student profile and background and their search history or the apps that they use. And then when that works and the student gets interested, the chances are that they get answers to their first questions and queries via AI-powered chatbots whose qualities dramatically improved compared to these clunky chatbots of the past. So today's chatbots are like virtual assistants who understand contacts, who come across more human and can even recognize specific emotions and adjust their language accordingly. The question that arises, Paris, is, you know, it's an interesting one. I think how personal or impersonal is personalized marketing? Is personalized marketing maybe dehumanized marketing? And what about authenticity, which every market here, and I'm sure you'll agree, Paris, is it remains where authenticity remains the strongest way to connect with potential customers to build a relationship and create a sense of loyalty for our brand. This, mm -hmm. this process, fascinating, and this, by the way, also one of the topics of ISAF Digital, a session where, which is titled um, Balancing Automation with Authenticity, Understanding the Human Factor in Digital Student Recruitment. It's just super interesting. Yeah, it's a very good point. And I do think that there are a lot of uh, cultural differences to pay attention to here. The first question that I asked myself and as we're preparing for, for the conference and we're, we're also preparing an AI solution, which is going to be the, the initial parts of that journey will be interacting with an AI avatar in an ad, followed by interacting with an AI chatbot. So going from a, a, a monologue to a dia dialogue situation. But what I'm trying to figure out is where is the best point of a handoff? Because there, there absolutely needs to be a handoff from the AI to a human expert recruiter. But at what point of information gathering 
Because in some ways, an AI that's trained with the right information can actually provide more accurate and instant answers. But let's say I'm at a point of the journey where uh, maybe I'm uh, a father of someone who wants to study abroad and, and I'm from Vietnam. And I, I don't even know what I don't know. I just know that I've got a smart kid and I want this kid to, to, to go out and, and have the best opportunity in life. And I'm pretty sure that the kid's got great opportunity, but I don't know anything about the schools. If I were to ask that to a student recruiter, I'm not really sure how to start that conversation. But if I go into a chat environment and I say, hey, my kid's got a 4.2 GPA, perfect scores in math. He's won math competitions. SAT score is 1,500. TOEFL is 100. And he wants to go into civil engineering, let's say, if he knows. Just give me an idea. U.S., Canada, U.K., Give me an idea, an idea of where you can get into. Give me a top 10 best fit. Now, that answer can now come instantly and very accurately. And then I would presume, okay, now it's time to speak to a human consultant. You've got a list of 10, 15, maybe 20 schools, and you're probably only going to apply to between five to eight of them. Now I really need to talk to someone that knows about these schools that, that can help me dive deeper. To me, I think that's the right experience. But I'm also asking, well, have any of these parents, so you're talking about parents maybe in their 40s, 50s, are they even using ChatGPT yet? Have they ever seen this technology? Well, maybe in South Korea, they're further ahead than where we are, and, and everybody's into this. But maybe in Vietnam, in poor communities, in Africa, parts of the Middle East, not at all. And this might be the very first AI interaction that that 48-year-old mother ever has. Maybe she's been using Instagram for the last 10 years, but never had an AI experience. So is this too, too soon? Is it going to be too disruptive for a parent who's making this decision? Now, I don't have an answer to that yet, but I'd love to find out through testing it and certainly would love to find uh, partners who, who want to yeah. test that out as well. Because I, I think that there's huge efficiency there. There is. If you can get the right experience on the front end and then the right handoff I think we can all agree that with the digital innovations that come with so many benefits and advantages that make the process more efficient and quicker and more accurate. A couple of things to keep in mind. I think you mentioned a couple of really good ones. The, the internet is different per country. The ecosystem is different per country. Then the other thing you mentioned, the, these chatbots or these digital uh, recruiters, they need the right information. Now, that's a very important starting point, because I think we could argue that any student recruiting process could potentially be entirely automated. The question is, do we want that? And that automation, what is it based on? Is it based on historic data? Well, you know, people change, uh, countries change, cultures change. So how long does that data remain accurate? Is that data not biased? How does it work when you think of students, not just uh, their scores, and you said, you know, the student uh, won math, and the competitions and what have you, we can probably come through an automated solution with a couple of really good suggestions. But what about that student's personal interest and background and, and personality? And where does that student feel most comfortable? Well, and which school can give him that kind of environment? Is that a bigger or a smaller school? Is that a school in a, in a big city or in a more rural area? Is that a school with a specific teaching format? There are so many factors mm -hmm involved that go beyond data because that's i think very often the challenge here when it's all data driven does that then miss out on that human factor that i mentioned earlier what about the the personality factor emotional factor these are all very important factors these are human factors and that's a fascinating topic that we'll be indeed be discussing where does automation and the human factor start yeah and I think that parents and students who are making the biggest decision, uh, one of the biggest decisions, if not the biggest decision of their lives, trust is a major, major factor. And I don't think that AI in any form, not today or maybe not in the future either, could deliver the same degree of trust that a human expert can deliver. So while it, it could expediate things on the front end, I know as a parent, and my daughter is not yet of, of uh, college age, but four or five more years, I'll be in that position. Uh, I don't think there would be any way that I would base such an important decision on just information that I've researched on my own or that has been delivered to me through through AI. I would really want to speak to to people 
either recruitment agents or directly the folks at the school. Because where... you could argue to what the, what level of trust can AI give you, but what level of care do you get from a, from AI? What kind of support do you get from AI? What kind of comforts do you get from AI? What kind of empathy do you get from AI? Right, all these human factors are just as important, if not more important to reassure the student, the family, that they're making the right choice and that they're getting the right type of support and guidance through that journey, which is not just the selection of where to study, but it's also actually the, the education, the career, future opportunities. This is a once in a lifetime decision and it's about a lifetime, right? It's not about buying a book or, or buying a, a car or this is something important and relevant to this young person's future and that requires the right assistance and and that brings us back to the fact that that assistance can be boosted and supported and and strengthened with technologies but that the human mm -hmm. factor remains crucial you touched on a, a very important point which is not only the acceptance rates or the ability to be accepted into a great school but also data points around the graduation rates and the job placement or the, my the ability yeah. rates really Post, yeah, post-graduation, because ultimately the, the real ROI on a university education is going to be fr coming from the career that happens afterwards. And, and that's very important. And I think there the data gets a little bit harder to, to collate, let's say. I mean, maybe graduation rates are okay, but you would really need to follow post-graduation careers, job offers. I know that in the MBA space, they do this pretty well. They tout these statistics a lot. Average average starting salaries post-graduation. I don't think that happens as much in, at the university level. You're right. We recently posted an article on ISAF Monitor, which is our source for information and trends and an analysis that are relevant for professionals in international education. But it highlighted the fact that there's simply not enough data available to provide the level of transparency that is needed for the, the international students as they make their choices, right? Ironically, this is again where data comes in, where transparency comes in, access to data comes in, and digital solutions can be the, the solution for this. But this is, again, a very important point, and it just highlights the fact that there are so many different factors that play an important role in the uh, ultimate decision of a student and their families on where, where to study, right? So that's indeed the, the, the scores that they achieved and the potential that they have a specific institution and whether they can get accepted or not, whether it's affordable or not, which environment is it in, how does it match with their personality, what about their mental health, cultural impact, language impact, and then future is the employability. So all these factors combined are all topics. Uh... Yeah. Let's hone in on ISAF Digital. We're going to be there for the first time. I'm really excited to tell our audience about ISAF Digital. And for those that might be going, what's it all about? Yeah. Thanks for that. So where ISAF typically uh, organizes events where we allow education providers to connect with the right partners that can help them with their international student recruitment strategies and, and uh, numbers, that normally means that we help them connect very much with the study abroad agencies. But at the same time, we do realize that there is a rapid digital transformation happening, not just in international education, but across the board, and that there's so much technology and, and innovations coming at us that it's sometimes very overwhelming to keep track of what this all means to us as a person, as a professional, as an organization. And actually what I find fascinating myself, and then I'll tell you what Eyes of Ditch is about, but this industry is about change, right? People, youth and students who are about to go through the biggest change that they will ever experience in their lifetimes, as we already discussed. They move away from their natural habitat and their comfort zone, so a new place with a different culture, different people, different education system, everything is different. And to go through that as a young adult, full of uncertainties and insecurities, so far having lived a life supported by parents and family, that's quite an adventure. It's an adventure made me frightening in the beginning, and ultimately it's expected to bring success, a good career, you mentioned it, employability, the realizations of their dreams and hopes change for the better. And at the same time, the very people who encourage and support and guide this next generation through this process of significant change, they themselves often seem to be opposing change themselves. And what, with that, I mean opposition against these technological innovations, against AI, against digital transformation, which is a pretty word for digital change, kind of that fear of the unknown. And this is where Eyes of Digital comes in because I, I believe that embracing that digital transformation and exploring the tools and technologies that are out there may perhaps be frightening at first. It's that so-called fear of the unknown, as I mentioned. 
But similar to that student, Paris, once you embark on that journey, once you invest time and resources and effort, you'll discover how these innovations can help you be more successful and more efficient and come out better and stronger as a professional, as a person, and as an organization. And that's what we'll be doing at ISAF Digital. We're dedicating an entire day to walk through the student recruitment funnel and to identify which digital and AI innovations are relevant for us as professionals. How can they help us improve what we do? How do they impact us? Which dangers out there? What should we be concerned about? How can we influence this process? And it starts by just being aware of us out there. You'll probably have a better understanding what the future of international student recruitment is, is like. And a lot of the questions you asked on this podcast are questions that we're getting asked every day by the professionals in our sector. We don't have all the answers, but we're very good at organizing events and we're therefore good at organizing events where we bring together the right people. So, you know, we've got MailChimp talking, uh, we've got Microsoft, but we also have institutions talking about case studies. We'll talk about the human factor in digital recruitment. We'll talk about uh, digital communication tools or even AI language learning as a driver of language travel. There's a whole range of topics or even campfire sessions where the delegates can actually be involved in the discussions themselves. So it's really taking that responsibility that we have as a major player in international education to keep informing and educating the stakeholders in our sector about the innovations that this industry is going through. Excellent. Yeah. And I presume agencies, their business model is to get kids enrolled. Aren't they mostly getting paid on the enrollment or yeah, so the, is it on the application? The agency receives a commission on the tuition fee and whenever they enroll a student. Now, exceptions exist, of course. I'm sure there are agencies that have a retainer fee or a monthly fee, but typically it's the, the, uh, the institution that pays. And although indirectly it's the student that pays the tuition, but the percentage of the tuition goes to the agency. Yeah. So in agencies that want to grow, they must, I think, embrace digital to be more efficient because that's going to help them reach more students and maybe be able to expand geographically into more regions or more countries yeah. and also probably be able to expand their list of schools that they work with. Is that the typical growth ambitions of, of the recruitment agencies? That's difficult to say. There's so many different types of recruitment agencies. You've got your mom and pop uh, boutique agent who send maybe a handful of students every year. And then you have your uh, stock listed mm -hmm. uh, international companies who recruit students from all corners of the world. And then there's anything in between. And the objectives and goals of each agency mm -hmm. are, of course, difficult. Although I hope and assume that every agency in the end has the student at the center and making sure that they have the right future ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a fascinating industry. And I have been looking into it a lot deeper recently. There are th thousands, if not tens of thousands of these agencies all around the world. Correct. And 2,000 of those have already gone through a very strict IAS screening process. So that's a, that's a good sign. There are lots of agencies out there. And the good thing for ISAF is that we only accept uh, the agencies of the highest standards at our institute screening. Yeah. I suppose you all are probably the closest thing to a real accreditation Yeah, well, process. Yeah, the closest, or maybe we space. are that. You consider us yeah. that we have all our agencies that went through the process. They have a uh, blockchain verified uh, QR code that institutions involved can always check the status of that agency, whether they are indeed screened and approved by us. So that's part of that mission mm -hmm. statement that we alluded to earlier. But another thing you just mentioned is the stakeholders in international education should embrace change. And I think that's always something we've always seen throughout history, right? If you if you cannot change with the world around you, you become irrelevant. If you run an organization, then you want to respond to the needs that exist in the market and you also want to remain competitive. So what we're doing here with ISAF Digital, for example, is make sure that they are aware of the tools that will make them and keep them competitive, but also understand what their competition is doing and where these technologies are leading. That's an important uh, goal to have. Excellent. Well, Martin, this has been great, and I'm really looking forward to, to meeting you in person in a few weeks in Berlin. It's going to be a lot of fun, and good luck to you at the event as the, as the organizer. I'm sure it's going to be a, a big success. Is there anything else that we didn't talk about, or, or was there a question that you were hoping I was going to ask that you feel could benefit our audience as we wrap up? Well, first of all, I'm also looking forward to seeing you, Paris. I, I, I guess that what, what, one thing that needs to be said here is that when we talk about technological innovations, it has the word technology in it. And that often turns off a lot of people. And what we try to 
repeats to everyone involved and everyone that's considering to attend this event, they don't have to worry. This is not about technology. This is not about how technology works. This is about how technology can work for you. And to get there, we have the service providers there with us who can actually help implement new technologies, who have the tools available, who are there to consult you. And I guess that's exactly what you guys are doing, Paris. You're right. You are assisting institutions mm -hmm. with their digital marketing transformation, for example. So we have always brought together the professionals that can help education providers and agencies be more successful. And that's the same thing we're doing here in the digital space. We're helping the agencies and educators connect with the digital service providers for them to be guided through this digital transformation and use all these innovations to their advantage. So I'm looking for very much forward to, to it myself because it's just a mix of those discussions about these technologies and how they can work for you, but also what that impact what impact they have on our jobs and on our companies. And there's some fascinating conversations that, uh, that are coming out of that. Great. Well, looking forward to it, Martin. Thank you for spending the time with me today. I'm really excited to get this episode out. And uh, thank you again and have a great Thanks day. Thanks very much, Paris. It was a pleasure.